Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy false prophets and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor as the labor progresses the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes as we get closer to jesus return all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense all of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time we have reached the stage where there is literally no pause between major weather disasters hitting the world. It is just one disaster after another. When times were normal, there would be a major disaster every once in a while. But now we have reached the stage where there's literally no pause between them. Sadly, this is how it's going to be now. It's just going to be one disaster after another. And most people will have absolutely no idea why any of this is happening. We are living in very troubled times and people need hope. We read about that hope in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We also read about those who do not believe in Jesus are condemned and love darkness rather than light in John 3.18-20. He who believes in him is not condemned but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. If you have not already done so, I strongly urge you to call upon the name of Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior today. We begin in eastern Libya, where thousands have died in devastating floods and more than 10,000 are still missing. On Sunday, more rain fell in one day than over the past 40 years. It burst two dams upstream, channeling a wave of destruction towards the port city of Dena. A witness to the disaster points to where the flooding that would devastate Dena was unleashed. Two dams holding huge amounts of water burst, sending a wave towards the city. When the dam walls crumbled, almost like a reversed tsunami, the water cut through Derna's neighborhoods, destroying bridges, roads and homes, sweeping residents out to sea as the waves struck the low-lying coastal town. Derna had a population of around 100,000. The human cost of the disaster is still being counted. The death toll is huge. There's major flooding overseas as well in Libya, where thousands were feared dead from catastrophic floods. Up to 10,000 more might be missing. Massive rainfall caused dams to collapse. This is a powerful storm that is causing catastrophic flooding in Libya, bringing with it strong storm winds, devastating some parts of the country and completely wiping out entire towns. And you can see the damage from the air, the sheer force of the rain triggering flash floods, destroying buildings and cars with water gushing down roads. The death toll is climbing. We are getting some staggering numbers this morning. The Libyan health minister estimates that at least 3,000 people have been killed so far and in one city alone in the eastern city of Derna 700 people have been killed the Red Crescent reports that at least 10,000 people are missing the US Embassy is already offering humanitarian assistance and they need it search and rescue teams are struggling to get to the devastated areas officials fear that the death toll is going to rise overnight officials warning the flood emergency in Massachusetts could get even worse as rivers north of Boston begin to crest find a high spot somewhere find a high spot and stay there until this is over 
Six to nine inches of rain fell in a matter of hours, submerging cars in Lemonster, forcing drivers to abandon their vehicles on the highway. People were sitting on top of their cars just waiting for um, someone to come and rescue them. First responders rescued multiple people at a flooded mobile home community as the mayor went on social media to plead with people to stay off the roads. Torrents of water washing away asphalt, opening up large sinkholes across the city. These catch basins are coming right out of the ground. You're going to drive over one of them. All the streets are flooded. To the south in Rhode Island, powerful floodwaters poured into homes and businesses, submerging the state's capital. Days of storms in the Northeast already caused at least one death in Northeast Pennsylvania. A Coast Guard vessel sailing into New York captured these lightning strikes. And this water spout formed off New Jersey. God controls the skies and the rain. God controls the wind. God has power over the clouds. God has power over lightning. God is in control of all things, including the weather. Through his providence, God provides for and protects his children. But he also permits Satan, demons, and mankind to exercise their limited will to commit acts of sin, evil, and wickedness. We may not always know why evil acts or natural disasters happen, but we can be assured that God is working all things together for his purpose and for our good, as we read in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Jeremiah 23.19-20 Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is going forth in fury, a violent whirlwind. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days you will understand it perfectly. Whirlwind is the Hebrew word shiara, which means a hurricane. Jeremiah 23, 19-20 can be translated like this. Behold, a hurricane of the Lord has gone forth in fury, a violent hurricane. It will fall violently on the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it perfectly. We are tracking the powerful Hurricane Lee in the Atlantic. Jordan Steele from our partners at the Weather Channel has more. Jordan, good morning. Here's the latest. Hurricane Lee, that major hurricane spitting at 120 miles per hour in the Atlantic. Now, this thing just went through a second eyewall replacement cycle, which means it may strengthen briefly before moving into cooler waters. Those cooler waters, by the way, left by Hurricane Franklin and Idalia. So the next 24 to 36 hours, Lee's going to turn northwest and eventually to the north. We know the model guidance continues continues to agree on placement just west of Bermuda. That's the good news. The not so good news is what happens after that by this weekend. There's still so much confusion up here into parts of the northeast. We know we're going to see impacts and those impacts are going to be huge waves and dangerous rip currents for all of our east coast locations. Speaking of which we are still tracking several storms after Lee you guys and those could be inching closer to home. Luke 2125 and there will be signs in the sun in the moon and in the stars and on the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. The desperate search for survivors of Morocco's devastating earthquake continues at this hour. Many of the affected places are remote. That means they're very difficult to reach. The death toll has now risen since Friday to more than 2,800 people, and that number is likely to go up. High in the Atlas Mountains, the area that's been most devastated by this earthquake. It's, just take a look at these mud brick dwellings crumbling under the weight of that initial impact, not to mention the aftershocks. We felt one just moments ago in that village over there on the hills where 48 people were killed by the initial quake. Now, take a look at this. In order to get them any help, Vehicles need to come up this road, the only main highway for getting people help in this area, a one lane highway prone to traffic jams, rock slides, things that could mean the difference between life and death. Time is ticking, but rescuers are digging in the dirt, rescuing their own sisters, wives and children and holding back the sand in the hourglass. I heard my sister screaming, brother, brother, save us. I rescued her and her son and her husband, says Mohamed Uchin. We used our bare hands because we didn't have tools. 
But such scenes of joy, more common shortly after the quake, are growing increasingly rare. It's now day four since the quake. And only now are rescuers able to reach the most remote victims. The crucial golden period, the best window for finding survivors who might still be struggling to survive beneath the rubble, is now closed, and many victims could not be saved. Here in the High Atlas Mountains, the epicenter of the quake, these jagged cliffs, serpentine passages, and rustic dwellings are just as awe-inspiring as they are lethal. Many of these homes are made out of mud bricks, so they don't just collapse, they crumble, and they don't leave any air pockets for survivors who tend to just choke to death on the dust. And if there was anyone to save, locals tell us they had to save themselves. The government didn't come. We didn't see anyone after the earthquake. They only came to count the number of victims. Since then, no one is here with us, says Muhammad Aitli. Morocco has been delivering help of its own, medicine, food, water. We've seen helicopters fl flying overhead, uh, government vehicles driving by. But we get the sense at this point it's mostly aid for the living. At this point, so late in the game, people tell us it's not very likely that they're going to find survivors. What we are witnessing is just a glimpse of what the seven year tribulation will be like. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction, and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24:21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven-year tribulation, in which the inhabitants of planet Earth, who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin, will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion meaning two billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100 pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to four billion. North Korean state television showed Kim Jong-un waving to top government and military officials as he left Pyongyang on his bulletproof train for Russia. And he has good reason to be smiling. As the slow-moving train crossed the Russian border, Kim is finally feeling needed, courted by President Vladimir Putin. Two of the leaders America is most wary of are coming together. Putin, attending an economic forum in the eastern city of Vladivostok, is expected to greet Kim with the full honors of a state visit. A new model of mutual relations and integration is being born, but not on a basis of Western standards, Putin said. There's a more practical reason for the rare summit, too. North Korea produces artillery and missiles, which it aims at South Korea, a close U.S. ally. But since the two Koreas haven't fought a war in decades, the North has vast stockpiles of the weapons, which Putin needs now to fend off Ukraine's American-backed counteroffensive. The weapons transfer would be a violation of international sanctions. But for two states already under sanctions, that could be little deterrent. Deals are already in motion. 
Putin's defense minister was in Pyongyang in July to discuss an arms trade. A top Chinese Communist Party member joined the Russian defense minister at a military parade. It's unclear what Putin would give Kim in return, but it's expected to include food and support for North Korea's advanced weapon systems. Kim just oversaw the launch of what North Korea called its first tactical nuclear attack submarine. Putin's desire to continue his war here in Ukraine is bringing together Russia, China, and now North Korea. The Biden administration striking a deal with Iran to swap prisoners and release $6 billion in frozen Iranian funds without fear of violating U.S. sanctions. General, uh, good morning. Your reaction of a deal that, by the way, we learned about on the anniversary of 9-11. It's not good. When you look at that, the deal, and, and the timing was terrible, when it was really announced yesterday on the 22nd anniversary uh, of 9-11, and people need to understand that Iran's not a friend of the West at all. I mean, these are the largest arms supplier to the Russians in their fight against Ukraine right now. They're a very destabilizing force in the Middle East. They're looking to, towards heading for, at least heading towards, a nuclear breakout in the near term. And they're pulling allies away from us. You know, that recent deal that they cut with the Saudis, brokered by the Chinese, to have peace between both of them, this is not good. And, and then when you look at the outreach they've got to terrorist organizations like Hezbollah, that's that where that money is going. You know, President Biden said, well, the money's going to go to humanitarian efforts. No, it's not. Anybody in their right mind knows exactly where it's going to go. It's going to go to terrorist activities, support of military activities by the Quds Force, which are external operations, and, and their fight against Israel. And the Iranians are in particular here, you know, they're targeting Americans. I mean, they're, they're targeting Americans. Uh, kidnappings, uh, and then there's and there's that. Well, the prisoner swap is fine. We'll put the money up there. But they're targeting Americans, and then there's ransoms. And then you have Putin and Kim Jong Un here arriving in Russia for highly anticipated talks, of course, with um, with the Russian president. I I'm just looking at this: Russia plus Kim Jong Un, and then you have Iran. They all seem to be working yeah. against us. So, what is the end game for what I'm quite frankly going to refer to as this axis of bad actors? This is just not good. When you look at uh, Kim Jong-un heading to Vladivostok, I think he's there right now, and working with Putin, it's a quid pro quo. He's going to supply the Russians with a lot of ammunition, military support in their fight against Ukraine. And what Russia's going to do is provide them some type of economic support and probably technology support as well to advance their nuclear program. What I see right now is you see this coalescing of people that are not friendly to the United States. You look at the alliance you've got between China, between North Korea, between Iran and Russia as well. And it's something we have to counter. And we haven't done that. We've kind of left Kim Jong-un alone over the last few years, hoping he'd kind of just sit on the sidelines and do, not do very much. He's always been a bad actor. We've tried to take him off the stage, in other words, isolate him under the last administration. And this administration just ignored him. And there's one thing we found about Kim Jong-un. You can't ignore that man. You can't ignore what he does because he's trying to do a breakout of technology, advanced nuclear weapons, advanced his ability to have more and better and longer range ICBMs. It's just a real threat. And you look at all these things coming together and it's a very disturbing development in, in the area of national security and it's something we're going to have to address. It's something we are not addressing right now. We're going to have to address in the future of all these nations coming together and it's a threat to the United States and to the Western world and to the Pacific. As well. What's at stake here as far as what these two leaders could be swapping <clears throat> into a laundry list of weaponry? It seems that we are in, in a more precarious position now than we've been in the last 22 yeah. years. And I, I think there's, there's a lot of concern that we are weak on the world stage. And, and a lot of that is that criticism, criticism is falling on President Biden. How you really tell that is you, when you look at our allies moving away from us, or at least going to middle ground, you see what the Saudis have recently done when they've actually reached out to the Chinese to broker a deal between them, they, they and the Iranians. And you, when you look at the, the other nations look at the United States, and do they see strength or weakness? And if they see weakness, they're going to move toward, toward strength, which is unfortunately some of our adversaries. We are looking more and more towards this destabilized world. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads. 
because your redemption draws near. Will the rapture of the church take place on Rosh Hashanah 2023, which begins at sundown on Friday, September 15th, and ends at sundown on Sunday, September 17th? The Jewish prophet Amos records that God declared he would do nothing without first revealing it to his servants, the prophets. From the Old Covenant to the New, Genesis to Revelation, God provides picture after picture of his entire plan for mankind, and one of the most startling prophetic pictures is outlined for us in the Jewish feasts of Leviticus 23. The Hebrew word for feasts, moed, literally means appointed times. God has carefully planned and orchestrated the timing and sequence of each of these seven feasts to reveal to us a special story. The seven annual feasts of Israel were spread over seven months of the Jewish calendar at set times appointed by God. They are still celebrated by observant Jews today. But for both Jews and non-Jews who have placed their faith in Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, these special days demonstrate the work of redemption through God's Son. The first four of the seven feasts occur during the springtime. These are Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Weeks, and they all have already been fulfilled by Christ in the New Testament. The final three feasts, Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles occur during the fall, all within a short 15-day period. Many Bible scholars and commentators believe that these fall feasts have not yet been fulfilled by Jesus. However, the blessed hope for all believers in Jesus Christ is that they most assuredly will be fulfilled. As the four spring feasts were fulfilled literally and right on the actual feast day in connection with Christ's first coming, these three fall feasts, it is believed by many, will likewise be fulfilled literally in connection to the Lord's second coming. In a nutshell, here is the prophetic significance of each of the seven Levitical feasts of Israel. Passover, pointed to the Messiah as our Passover lamb, whose blood would be shed for our sins. Jesus was crucified on the day of preparation for the Passover, at the same hour that the lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover meal that evening. Unleavened bread, pointing to the Messiah's sinless life, as leaven is a picture of sin in the Bible, making him the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus' body was in the grave during the first days of this feast, like a kernel of wheat planted and waiting to burst forth as the bread of life. First fruits, pointing to the Messiah's resurrection as the first fruits of the righteous. Jesus was resurrected on this very day, which is one of the reasons that Paul refers to him in 1 Corinthians 15:20 as the first fruits from the dead. Weeks, or Pentecost, occurred 50 days after the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and pointed to the great harvest of souls and the gift of the Holy Spirit for both Jew and Gentile, who would be brought into the kingdom of God during the church age. The church was actually established on this day when God poured out his Holy Spirit and 3,000 Jews responded to Peter's great sermon and his first proclamation of the gospel. Trumpets, the first of the fall feasts. Many believe this day points to the rapture of the church when the Messiah, Jesus, will appear in the heavens as he comes for his bride, the church. The rapture is always associated in scripture with the blowing of a loud trumpet, as we read in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 and 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The Feast of Trumpets is also referred to as the Feast of the New Moon, for it is the only annual feast of God that commences with the lunar sign from the heavens. In ancient times, Jewish religious authorities had to wait until the new moon was actually seen by reliable witnesses. Before the month's activities could begin, the appointed time is stretched into two days, as no man knoweth the day or the hour. Thus, the authorities did not know when the Feast of Trumpets would actually commence. They did not know the day or hour. Jesus Christ made specific reference to this fact when he spoke of the time he would fulfill his promise to return. He said no one knows about that day or hour. It is the only feast day that is named as such, 
because they just didn't know which day was the correct day. Why two days? It is because of the uncertainty of when to declare the day, because the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets is based on the sighting of the first visible crescent of the new moon. And since the days counted are from the new moon to the next, no one is sure if it's the 29th or the 30th day of the month, so to be sure, they count both. During the feast, the trumpet is blown a total of 100 times, with the final horn blast lasting much longer than the first 99 blasts. This final blast pictures the trumpet sound, which many believe will announce the rapture of the church, which Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Disclaimer. I make no prediction of the Lord's return, as we cannot know the exact timing, but I am referencing scripture that gives us the information that points to a specific set of days as clues in his word. Day of Atonement. Many believe this prophetically points to the day of the second coming of Jesus when he will return to earth, tabernacles, or booths. Many scholars believe that this feast day points to the Lord's promise that he will once again tabernacle with his people when he returns to reign over all the world. Many scholars believe the rapture will occur on the Feast of Trumpets. We are to be watching as Jesus commands us in Luke 21, 36. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. No matter what happens or doesn't happen on this upcoming Feast of Trumpets, we are to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are your eyes fixed on Jesus? He is returning. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.